crosswalk, this is God's word. Luke 23, 1 to 12. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs, stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea and Galilee, Galilee, even in this to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he heard that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to, to Herod who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he, and he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Amen. Thank you, Maria. Church, you can go ahead and be seated. The title of this sermon is Jesus Political Trials. Jesus Political Trials. Last week, we saw that Jesus was mocked, he was beaten, he was blindfolded, repeatedly struck, and shamefully treated. Jesus was rejected by those he came to save. Though he is the Christ, the Son of Man and the Son of God, he endured being condemned to death so that he can accomplish our salvation. Today in our text, we'll see, we, have, we just read it, but we'll see that Jesus will be accused falsely. Have you ever been falsely accused? If you have... What was your first response when you were falsely accused of something? I bet your first response was to defend yourself. Especially if those accusations were false. When questioned repeatedly by Herod, Jesus made no answer. Jesus remained silent because he didn't need to defend himself. He was completely and is completely innocent. And by remaining silent, he actually fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy. Therefore, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of Man and he is the Son of God. We are to believe in him. Will you please pray with me? Father, we thank you that this morning when we woke up and got up, we were able to come and worship you in peace while the people in Israel, in the Gaza Strip, in Ukraine are going through unimaginable horror. We come freely. To worship you in song, in prayer, in our giving, and now in your word. Father, help us to not take for granted the peace that you have given us in this community. Help us to keep in mind brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted and are suffering. We pray now and turn our attention to your word that you would grant us the gift of illumination. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can open our 
eyes and our hearts to your word. That we may be sanctified, that you may be glorified. I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word, that, you would, that your word would go forth in power to transform us to be more like Christ. For your glory alone, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A wealthy Englishman lived in Europe for quite some time. And he was satisfied with nothing but the best. You ever tempted to live your life with nothing but the, but the best? This attitude extended as far as the cars that he owned. Now, back then, they didn't build Ford Raptors yet. So his pride and joy was a Rolls Royce coupe that he owned for many years. And this Rolls Royce gave him much pleasure for many years. One day he was driving down this country road and he hit this very deep pothole, resulting in an axle that was broken. The owner, had the car shipped back to the Rolls Royce plant in England and was surprised at the quick repair that was performed. He received no bill for the work, knowing that his warranty had run out. He expected a bill. And so he waited for months and months and no bill came. And so a man of integrity, as a man of integrity, he contacted the company about the bill that he should have gotten. Again, the, 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 the factory responded rather quickly. They said, we have thoroughly searched our files and found no record of a Rolls Royce axle ever breaking. In a similar way, there is no record that can be found in the Bible of Jesus misleading the nation of Israel. There is no record in the Bible that we can find of Jesus forbidding the people from giving tribute to Caesar. And there is no record that can be found in the Bible of Jesus as a king leading his people to rebel against the Roman Empire. The Savior was falsely accused. Here's the big idea of the sermon. Jesus is the Christ. He is the king who was falsely accused but was found innocent. Therefore, we are to believe in him. Remember, the purpose statement of the gospel of Luke is that our faith may be made certain. So Luke is in the process of helping us see that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, that he is the son of man that Daniel's prophecy was, was, was foretelling about. And he is the son of God. I was born of the Virgin Mary. And today, in the next few verses, we'll see that he is outright innocent of all charges. Therefore, we are to believe in him. I have two main headings for us this morning. First is Jesus' trial before Pilate. That's going to be over verses 1 through 7. And then verses 8 through 12, he's going to be in trial again, but this time before Herod, the Tetrarch. Let's dive into God's word. After having gone through two pre-trials with Annas and Caiaphas, Jesus was brought into a religious trial before the Sanhedrin, if you remember last week. Last week, we saw that the Sanhedrin, which was comprised of the chief priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, and the scribes, 
They had already made up their mind to put Jesus to death because he claimed to be the son of God. Both Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel say that they bound Jesus and they took him to Pilate, the governor at that time. There, Jesus was brought to his first political trial. Are you tracking with me? He started out with two pre-trials with Annas and Caiaphas. He was brought into a religious trial before the Sanhedrin, and now he's being brought to political leaders, namely Pilate and Herod. Currently, during our time, in our day, former President Trump is in the middle of a political trial, if you will. According to Time, in, the New, York, in New York, Trump faces 34 felony counts over allegations that he falsified business records to conceal hush money. He also faces 40 felony counts in Florida for all for allegedly hoarding classified documents and obstructing the government's efforts to retrieve them. There are other charges brought against him. And like Jesus, however, I bet at least one of these charges are accurate and true. Altogether, Jesus had to endure three political trials. First, his political trial before Pilate. Second, he'll, he'll face another political trial before Herod, King Herod. And then third, he'll go back before Pilate to face his final political trial before he is condemned to death. Since Israel was under Roman rule, they had no authority to put anybody to death. It was the Romans' political responsibility. And in the presence of Pilate, the religious leaders began accusing Jesus, verse 2. And they accused him of Three things. First, they accused him of misleading the nation. Now, to mislead the nation is to turn away from Israel. Is to, is to lead Israel, excuse me, to mislead a nation, Israel, is to, to lead Israel from rebelling against Rome. To be blunt, this was a flat out lie. In contrast, Jesus was seeking to lead the nation towards repentance, godly living, and eternal life. Second, they accused him of forbidding Israel to give tribute to Caesar. Again, this was a flat out lie. You see, back in Luke chapter 20, verse 25, Jesus said the opposite. By saying, give or render to Caesar the things of Caesar. Third, they accused him of saying that he is the Christ, a king. The titles Christ and King have kingly overtones. Although Jesus is Christ, the king. The lineage from the lineage of David, he, he really wasn't the kind of king that they were looking for. The, he wasn't really the kind of king that they were expecting. But the language of kingship gave concern or threat to Roman rule. So Pilate asked them point blank, are you the king of the Jews? Verse 3. And Jesus answered, you have said so. Now, one look at Jesus, one could tell that he wasn't the type of king that would lead a nation to rebel against Rome. In fact, in, in John chapter 18, this was actually one of the prayer texts that, that we had this morning during our prayer service. Jesus told him that, Jesus told Pilate that, that his kingdom was not of this world. 
we read and we prayed through. In fact, if, if, it's, if, if it was, then his servants would have fought to keep him from being delivered to the Gentiles. Pilate, having examined all of these accusations, came to a conclusion by saying, I find no guilt in this man. Verse 4. In fact, Pilate declares that Jesus is innocent three more times, or at three different times in verse 4, verse 14, and verse 22. You see, church, the more we dig into Luke's account of his gospel, the more we see that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, who is perfectly holy and innocent. Have you ever been pulled over for speeding? Most of us have, right? And sometimes we're, we're tempted to appeal in the court of law before a judge. Judge, I didn't see the stop sign or the speed limit. Judge, I'm from out of town, so I'm, from, I'm unfamiliar with this road. Judge, I'm late to my own funeral. I had to speed. I'm glad you guys are still tracking with me. <laughs> Though some of these things can be true, here's the truth. We still broke the speed limit. You agree with me? Yes. Guilty as charge. Listen, church, Jesus is the only one who was perfectly innocent, but condemned to die. Yet in his perfect holiness, in his perfect innocence, he went along with it so that he can earn our forgiveness, so that he can accomplish God's redemptive plan for our salvation. Therefore, church, we ought to believe in Jesus wholeheartedly as the Christ the Son of Man, and the Son of God. In matters of trial, after Pilate declared Jesus innocent, the whole case should have been closed. This is how a legal system is supposed to work, right? But, but it didn't stop there. The religious leaders who were motivated by hate and evil would not stop until the perfect, spotless Lamb of God was dead. In fact, they intensified their efforts to put Jesus to death when the wickedness of man was at its worst. God was seeking to sacrifice his best. For you and for me. They accused him again by saying he stirs up the people. Teaching throughout Judea from Galilee and all the way to this place, Jerusalem. Verse 5. Now Pilate, being a savvy politician, took note of their mention of Galilee. And so he asked Jesus, are, are you a Galilean? You see, if he was, then he was under Herod's jurisdiction. Therefore, he sent Jesus over to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at that time during the, the feast of the Passover. You ever dealt with governmental agencies? You ever called their 800 number? And if you're lucky, you get a live person. But then only be passed on to the next department, to the next person, to the next 1-800 number. That's what's, what's happening here. That's what Pilate is pulling. Therefore, he sent Jesus over to Herod, who was in Jerusalem. 
Here's the main next heading. Jesus' trial before Herod. This Herod is the one who was married to Herodias. And their marriage was the one that John the Baptist spoke against. You see, at one time, Herodias was married to Philip, who was Herod's brother-in-law. So Herodias was Herod's, sister, was Herod's sister-in-law, and this was against Jewish law. We see this in Leviticus 18, verse 6 and 16. This Herod is the one who beheaded John the Baptist. The one who had uh, John the Baptist beheaded. He heard about Jesus and he longed or desired to see Jesus. And so when he saw Jesus, he was very glad. Verse 8. But this Herod had no spiritual interest in Jesus. You know what he was really interested about? He wanted to be entertained. He wanted to see signs and wonders done by Jesus. And so he questioned Jesus at length. But Jesus made no answer. Verse 9. When falsely accused, Jesus Remain silent. A young man once said to John Wesley, I think I know what my gifting is. So Wesley replied, tell me. He replied, I think it is to speak my mind. Wesley replied, I do not think God would mind if you bury that gift. When there is plenty of words, there will be many transgressions, a Proverbs once said. Why did Jesus remain silent before Herod? The Bible doesn't really say why. Perhaps maybe there was nothing left to say to Herod. No doubt Herod had heard about Jesus' fame. We see this in Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Perhaps he had heard Jesus teach in the synagogues. After John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus preached about the gospel of God. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel of God. Mark, 14, or Mark 1, verses 14 through 15. But Herod didn't believe. Maybe you've, you've grown up in the church. Maybe you've been attending Crosswalk. At Crosswalk, we preach the gospel. The gospel is the central message of Crosswalk. You've heard it over and over and over, every Sunday after every Sunday, but yet you continue to reject it. Well, this is a warning for you. One day, there will be no longer any opportunities to hear the gospel. Judgment day will come. So if that is you, Repent and believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16 verse 31. Maybe Jesus remained silent because he was entrusting himself to the Father. Perhaps he, he remained silent because he wanted to stick to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God for our redemption, for our forgiveness. Perhaps Jesus knew in, his, in the Father's definite plan and foreknowledge that he would be vindicated at the perfect time when he was raised from the grave. Perhaps Jesus remained silent because he knew he was innocent, sinless, and perfect and didn't need to defend himself. 1 Peter 2, 
Verses 22 through 23 says this. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. Church, next time we get falsely accused of something, let's be quick to listen. Let's be slow to defend. And let's trust in the Lord for our defense. Jesus also remains silent because he is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He prophesies of a suffering servant. Jesus is the suffering servant. Jesus is our suffering servant. He says this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that bore that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By fulfilling this prophecy, Jesus yet again proved that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the coming king who will be enthroned in the throne of David forever. He is the son of man who will one day return riding on the clouds where the trumpets will sound and a voice from heaven will cry out. When that day will come, he will judge the living and the dead. He is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, John 1.29. Even though the chief priests and the scribes stood by accusing him, Jesus made no answer. Jesus suffered unjustly. Jesus was punished, traded shamefully, undeservedly for you and for me. He endured this suffering. He endured these false accusations to accomplish the Father's plan to redeem you and me. He gave no answer because he is perfect, holy, and innocent. He needed no defense. Remaining silent, Herod and his soldiers mistreated Jesus and mocked him. By dressing him in a royal robe, Luke puts it as splendor clothing. And then, after treating him shamefully, after mocking him, he sent him back to Pilate, verse 11. Maybe you've experienced accusations after accusations by Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12, verse 10. You ever been accused by Satan? You ever feel condemned by his accusations? Do you ever realize that when you feel condemned by Satan's accusation, it is probably because they're true? Do you, do you understand that? Adultery, guilty, stealing, guilty as charged, lying, guilty, coveting, guilty, idolatry, guilty, materialism, guilty, pornography, guilty, cheating on taxes, Guilty. Rebellion. Guilty. You see, when this happens, we need to be silent. Because there is no just defense for our sin. Here's the good news, church. Only our advocate can defend us effectively. 
Though Jesus, our advocate, remains silent in his defense, he will not remain silent for your defense and my defense. Jesus said that he will acknowledge those who acknowledge him before men, Luke, 8, Luke 12, verse 8. And John writes this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Listen to this, church. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus, the righteous, is called to come along to our side, by our side. Jesus, the righteous, is our counsel for our defense. Jesus, the righteous, will plead for our cause before God the Father. Jesus, the righteous, will plead with God the Father for the pardon of our sins. Amen. Next time Satan accuses you of adultery, remember this. Jesus will say, paid in full. Next time he accuses you and attacks you for stealing, remember this, paid in full. Next time he accuses you of coveting, idolatry, materialism, pornography, cheating on taxes, and rebelling against him, remember this. If you are in Christ Jesus and you believe in him and place your faith in him and have given your life to him, pay in full. And here's the truth, church. God the Father doesn't have to be coerced. He doesn't have to be forced to pardon our sins because his wrath that was meant for you and me was completely satisfied at the cross when Jesus took it all and earned the forgiveness. Jesus turn God's justified wrath against our sin that was meant and directed for us, and he turned it into saving grace. Church, this is why he is worthy of giving ourselves to him. In conclusion, verse 12 says that Pilate and Herod became friends that day. Did you notice that? Before that day, they were enemies. This is a picture of reconciliation. Listen, church. Because Jesus remained silent when he was falsely accused. When he gave no answer, when he was questioned and, and treated shamefully. Mocked, beaten, and struck. He was eventually driven to the cross. And at the cross, even though he was innocent, he was crucified like a criminal. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins at the cross. His body was broken as our substitute at the cross. He endured the wrath that was meant for you and me. And at the cross, he died a sinner's death. A death that we deserve. And because his atoning death, his sacrificial death was sufficient, there was a greater picture of reconciliation. Sinful man, sinful woman reconciled to holy God. Amen. Church, this is the good news of the gospel. Would you stand with me? Father, we...